Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? The back? Can you hear me okay at the back? Okay, thanks. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to begin by thanking an anonymous donor for the power cable. Uh, I found it over there. I'll put it back there when I'm done. <laughs> um, it's tough when you're uh, traveling and you're not very organized. I don't have power, but I'm doing better than at breakfast because now I have some cash. When I went for breakfast, I had five cents in my pocket and she didn't take credit cards, <laughs> but she let me eat for free. So that was nice. So uh, I put down some references. Uh, so if you're interested in different parts of the um, stuff yesterday or today, then you can uh, look up uh, these papers. Uh, obviously, the usual disclaimers, this is just some random sampling of pretty extensive literature. Um, is there a way that uh, we can send this information over to everybody or? Okay, so we can do that at some point. Um, so uh, this is what I wanna cover today. Uh, you're learning about some really amazing and pretty technical stuff. So I'm going to try and give you a lighter talk today. Uh, not a lot going on. So we'll begin with a review of what we did. Uh, then I'll show you the measurements that uh, I barely got started on yesterday. And then we'll go from lensing to cosmology. Uh, just the state of the field, a few slides. I know David Weinberg showed that too, but a refresher wouldn't hurt. And from there, we'll go to modified gravity, motivation, screening, which I know Rachel Rosen um, has covered, uh, but you'll get a slightly easier flavor on screening. Um, and then some tests. Uh, mostly I'll talk about completely new kind of tests that you've probably um, not encountered. So, um, so, so those are the topics. So, um, so let's just do this lensing review. So yesterday we started with this metric. Um, and then we uh, got to some deflection angle. And then we switched to projections on the sky. Um, and then we claimed that observable quantities involve one more derivative uh, and we introduced these, um, these particular combinations where now derivatives are on the sky. The two potentials have been set equal as in GR um, and these are all projected quantities. Okay. Uh, by the way, at least two people attempted to come up with observables that don't involve second derivatives. So we just had a discussion about displacements. Um, so people are thinking uh, about interesting ways to measure displacements, the displacement field as well. Um, right. Um, So then we noted that this guy, um, now going back to 3D, um, can be written as a redshift integral of some geometric factors 
times the density fluctuation. Okay, so this kappa, which is the isotropic magnification piece in the weak lensing limit, is also the projection of the density. So that makes interpretation of kappa really easy. Okay, the amount of magnification you see is just related to the projected density. The awkward thing is that in weak lensing, by the way, that's the relationship to magnification is uh, linear uh, only in the weak lensing regime. In the strong lensing regime, the shear also contributes to magnification. Um, the awkward thing, though, is that this is the guy that's related to the ellipticity of a galaxy, and it's uh, what we measure. Okay, so we kind of avoided confronting the fact that for intuition and interpretation, we think about kappa, but what we actually measure is gamma. And gamma is like a tidal field, right? These are these cross terms and differences. Um, it's non-local. Um, uh, the relationship of gamma to the density is non-local, which you expect intuitively because a density fluctuation here can shear a galaxy here because gravity is non-local. So how do we interpret it? So um, I just thought I'd motivate that a little bit. Um, because I showed you this mass map. So this is uh, what we're doing with, uh, with real data now. So, so as I mentioned, we observed the shapes of these two million galaxies and made this mass map. So the mass map refers to kappa. So how did we get from the gamma inferred from two million galaxies to kappa? Well, if you write these equations in Fourier space, then you can see how. Um, so let's Fourier transform these. And then what do you get? Um, so in terms of this angular wave number L, let's define this Fourier space variable so L is this angular wave number then um, this guy Okay, so you measure your shear um, at, uh, so you have this big field, 150 square degrees. You um, pixelize it. You take all the galaxies in a pixel and use their, um, their ellipticities to measure the average shear within each pixel. And then you interpolate onto the grid uh, and now you're in business because once you have the shear field represented on a grid, you can do a Fourier transform. And once you do a Fourier transform, sorry, uh, then uh, you, know, you have an estimator of this guy, uh, and you can stick that in there, uh, and you can construct kappa. You inverse Fourier transform, and you get back that map. So the actual estimators are a little bit more complicated because we have a finite field. You have to deal with those masks in the middle. But um, at least formally, you can see that if you have a big enough field that the finite boundary uh, doesn't impact your Fourier modes too much, that's how you can do a reconstruction. So that's for wide field lensing. There are, so this is called, um, the simple version of this is the Kaiser Squires algorithm. It's called reconstruction of the mass field. So that's the general case, and it works as long as you have a wide enough field.
good question. Uh, uh, the question is, are we looking at a fixed redshift? So um, this is us. Galax the source galaxies are distributed, in this case, between redshift 0.6 and 1.3. So the lensing kernel, the weight uh, of the lensing mass uh, looks something like this. You know, this W function. Um, so if you ask a given density fluctuation, how much is it contributing to the lensing? Then it's multiplied by this guy, which I'm showing here. So that means that if you're halfway between the source and the observer, you make the maximum contribution. And if you're too close to the source or too close to the observer, you're not an effective lens. So from that, you can infer that the the peak is at about 0.4, redshift 0.4, is where the lensing is happening. Was that sort of your question? Yeah, um, you know, from this, you get this using Poisson's equation. So we've gone from psi to the density field and projected that. You could, okay. Other questions? Okay. So we did two other special cases. Uh, one was we looked at halos. Um, and for the spherical case, we claimed, or rather I claimed, you may or may not buy it, that this guy is the mean kappa inside that circle minus the kappa at that circle. So this set of equations, when you apply it to a spherically symmetric case, you get this simple relationship between gamma and kappa. Um, and, and we applied this to voids as well, which you also treat as spherically symmetric. Uh, we considered filaments, just this picture, that the shear field looks like this. Does anybody have a two-line explanation for why? So just to remind you, for the sphere, it looks like this. So uh, you noticed uh, Bruce Partridge showed you the polarization pattern around a temperature hotspot. Completely different physics. To me, this is uh, easier to see uh, that a, a spherical object can produce an Einstein ring, which looks like this. So the weak lensing shear field looks like that. Polarization is harder. Um, but anyway, uh, from this, how do you get this if you have a filament? Well, if the filament is made up, sorry, anybody want to try? Our, uh, so. So if you have a galaxy sitting here, it'll be distorted like this. If you have a galaxy sitting here, it'll be distorted like this, the background galaxy. That's the claim. And the explanation uh, is that if, uh, if you imagine a filament made up of a bunch of little halos, then you know if you're sitting between two halos, then you know that each halo is going to distort it like this. This halo is going to distort it like this. There's as many here as they're here. So you have no choice but to get a whisker this way. If you have a finite filament and you're really far away from it, then it's just like a point mass. So it'll do this. 
as you get closer, you kind of end up here. So, Uh, so that's what a filament looks like. Um, just to keep things interesting, um, you know, this is the spherically symmetric piece. In general, halos are neither filaments nor spheres. In general, halos actually look like this. They're ellipses. So if you wanted to figure out what the shear pattern due to an elliptical halo is, how would you do it? You can decompose it into a monopole and a quadrupole. So let's look at this monopole a little bit. The shear rotates like this. And as I claimed yesterday, by the time you go to pi, um, this is your angle. Uh, by the time you come to pi, the shear is back to where you started, right? That's why the shear is like a spin two field. Whereas if you had a velocity field or something, you'd have to go all the way around to get back where you started. So this is the shear field uh, due to um, a monopole. Um, so a monopole has this cosine two theta variation. What would the shear field due to a quadrupole look like? Suppose my lens, instead of the sphere, was uh, an elliptical object that was oriented this way. So the long axis is along the x-axis. If this is cosine 2 theta, would a quadrupole be cosine 3 theta, 4 theta, 5 theta? Sine 3 theta? If it was sine 3 theta, um, then uh, sorry, uh, if it was cosine three theta, then somewhere over here you would you would get back to this shear. Now odd multiples don't quite work. So it would be so. This is a cosine two theta. Uh, a quadrupole would be a cosine 4 theta. So it's not even obvious that it has to be a cosine, but it, uh, it, it could be either a cosine or a sine, but it looks like this. You can see it's not easy. <laughs> okay. Uh, so it's rotating twice as fast. You're back here uh, by the time you're at pi over 4. Um, that's what it looks like. Uh, the reason I'm spending time on all these void and filament and uh, quadrupole patterns is that I have a, a student who's now a postdoc at Penn who's uh, obsessed with these, and he's made some beautiful measurements. So we're actually uh, writing up a paper on this quadrupole measurement. So uh, you know, if you can measure the lensing around voids and the ellipticity of dark matter halos, then you can do a lot. Because with the monopole, everything is degenerate. Gravita uh, you know, the gravitational infall, the nature of dark matter, the um, yeah. Uh, you know, the nonlinear physics of gravitational infall and the gravitational law itself are degenerate, so you have to do careful simulations. Uh, but with the quadrupole, you can do some pretty first order tests of gravity and dark matter. So, so that's why we are trying to measure it uh, from this loan survey. Any questions?
Yes, right. That's a great point. And that's because um, when you make a filament out of this, this is just the quadrupole piece. But the filament also has a monopole piece. And the monopole piece is five or 10 times bigger. So that's why um, over here, the monopole and quadrupole align. So there's no controversy that you end up with this pattern. But over here, the quadrupole has actually got the wrong sign. So it uh, reduces the monopole. But this is what you. This is what dominates here. It's a good point. OK. So the uh, very first lensing paper I wrote, we did like a little signal to noise estimate. Uh, and I tried to reproduce it yesterday, and I failed spectacularly. So <laughs> it's a really simple thing. So I was like, there's no way I need to prepare this, because you know, I know this in my sleep. And I was off only by a factor of 100. So, <laughs> so, uh, so I'll at least correct that uh, with a few minutes. So the question is, um, how many galaxies do you need to measure weak lensing? Um, and I had claimed that the signal is about 1%, and the noise is the intrinsic shape of a galaxy, which is about 0.3, is the uh, ellipticity, divided by the square root of number of galaxies. Um, but I forgot something uh, which, is, uh, which I was emphasizing the rest of the talk, that the signal depends on the coherence length you're looking at. So it's 1% only if you're looking on arc minute scales. But on arc minute scales, you don't get the answer that we got then. You don't get 1,000 galaxies or 10,000 galaxies to make a five sigma measurement. Um, so you have to go a little bigger. But when you go bigger, the signal drops. So on scales of 10 arc minutes or larger, uh, the signal is actually more like 0.2%, um, uh, whereas the noise just scales this way. So when you work that out, then you do get ng of 10 to the 5 to make a few sigma measurement of lensing. So that's kind of an important fact because uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, it's related to the development of technology and wide field cameras, which came online in the late 90s. And so, not surprisingly, the year 2000 was when the first um, detection of lensing was made. So, um, so this corresponds to something about the size of the moon. Um, so by the way, there's another subtlety to this that actually you need many patches. Otherwise, uh, you know, you're looking for an RMS signal. So with just one patch, you could be one sigma uh, um, off easily. So that makes the, ca the calculation actually more complicated. Um, but you need 10 to the 5 galaxies to make a few sigma detection. And then if you want to make like a 5% measurement, then you're very uh, quickly in the millions of galaxies regime, which is the state of the art of the field right now. So, um, so since you guys are mostly theorists, um, as I appreciated last night when over dinner uh, there was a 20 minute conversation involving the spin of an electron in effective field theories, um, I think it was totally unresolved, this question, right? Um, so, <laughs> So, uh, so this may surprise you. So, so we're talking about the scale about the size of the moon on the sky. So how many galaxies uh, can you detect in an area of the sky that's the size of the moon? That's, uh, that's not a bad guess. 
Uh, with a ground-based telescope, it would be like 10 to the 4. Uh, with the Hubble, you could get to this number, 10 to the 5. Other questions? All right, uh, let's go to the slides and uh, look at some results. All right, this is the last piece. So uh, let's look at these equations. So I, I talked about wide field, I talked about halos and these other special objects which are gonna be useful for measuring, um, uh, for testing gravity. The third thing is the fundamental thing, which is this quantity, the two-point correlation function of the shear as a function of separation angle theta. So you take two galaxies, you get an estimate of the shear, you take the complex conjugate of the second one, and um, so this product averaged over the whole sky and all pairs of galaxies is your two-point correlation function. Okay, I'm gonna write down something quite surprising, that this is identically equal to the two-point correlation function of kappa. So for all this talk about kappa and gamma being really different, kappa is local, gamma is non-local, this is convergence, this is tidal field, when you actually take the two-point function, um, they're identical. And you can see that if you take the Fourier transform, the power spectrum, then you can see that the square of this is uh, the sum of the square of these two. So it's not hard to prove. So that's a very useful thing. Doesn't hold for higher order functions. For higher order functions, this guy has like a billion components very quickly. Um, but uh, for the two-point function, this is a very handy thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the two-point function of the shear, and we're going to do it in a bunch of redshift bins. And that two-point function is just the projected power spectrum, because kappa is just an integral over delta. So uh, So that's this guy. So the thing you measure is actually just the two-point function of the density field times these things. So, um, so it's pretty easy to relate measurements to theory. And by using this tomography, uh, using these different redshift bins, we can probe sort of the evolution of the two-point function of the density field. So that's sort of the lensing cosmology program. So let's go from these mass maps to these two-point functions. So this was measured by the CFH Legacy Survey in a really nice paper. This is from the Dark Energy Survey. Can you see the preliminary thing? Uh, There's supposed to be a preliminary uh, uh, thing that says prelim it's, it's, it's on my laptop. That's weird. It doesn't show up here. Uh, it's light gray. Anyway, so this is showing the two-point function measured in three redshift bins, uh, you know, 0.4 to 0.6, 0.6 to 0.9, 0.9 to 1.2. So in the label, zero is the lowest redshift bin and black is the highest. So, but you get not just the three correlation functions, but also the cross correlations. So you end up with six correlation functions. Uh, and you can see the range of the axes. Uh, Y-axis is going from 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 6. Um, so that's 1% to 0.1% shears squared. And uh, the predictions are lambda CDM. This is not published. Uh, the analysis is blinded by a modest factor. So it's the relative spacing of the points that you can, that's still meaningful. Um, and so you can see that this is something we are just barely able to do. In three redshift bins, we can make measurements. You can see the lowest redshift bin is pretty crap, but if you look in an average sense,
the measurement scale with Redshift. The profile of the source galaxy, the light profile. Uh, yeah, the number density, you just count the galaxies. Yeah. It's, it's mm -hmm. so, so it depends on the survey. If you change the survey, this one. Right. And that changes the error bars. Yeah. OK. So uh, you know, Bruce emphasized to you how hard CMB polarization is. Um, and I emphasized yesterday why deconvolving the PSF makes lensing really hard. So this is one of the hardest measurements in cosmology. Um, and uh, so in our survey, the dark energy survey, we've just reached this point with a pretty small fraction of the survey. But it was uh, an enormous amount of work with galaxy shapes and photometric redshifts to get to this point. Um, this is galaxy galaxy lensing. So this is that, uh, you know, the monopole term of the mass profile. Um, so this is somewhat easier to measure. Um, and you can see that this is an NFW profile prediction. These are measurements. So this is in arc minutes. Uh, roughly speaking, this is one-tenth the virial radius. This is about the virial radius. And this is what's called the two-halo term. So uh, we measure it reasonably well. We can model it using this one-halo, two-halo decomposition. We can even look for satellite contributions. Um, it works pretty well. So I'm, I mentioned that we are measuring 0.1% shears comfortably. That's this level. 0.01%, we are not yet there yet. But we are somewhere in between. So this is the state of the art. We can use it to get contours. I'm not going to talk about this, but these tell you the mass of the halo. Uh, in which this galaxy is sitting. Sorry, models for the offset of the center. Oh, the center of the right. So you know the way this measurement is made is that you you pick a lens galaxy, and you measure the shear around it, and you do that for uh, in this case uh, about a hundred thousand lens galaxies. So um, each galaxy, you just have the light, and you're trying to measure the mass distribution on these huge scales. So the light may not be sitting at the center of the halo. And if that's the case, then the inner points will show a flattening. Because if the light is not at the center, then it's not at the peak of the density. And this can happen because galaxies merge, and they may not have resettled back into the bottom of the potential well. In this prediction, we've not tried to model that. When we look at galaxy clusters, we see a clear effect of, uh, of off-centering. OK, so I've talked about voids and filaments. So I thought I would show you a measurement of void lensing. Uh, Question somewhere? Uh -huh. Uh, so this is halos. We have a paper where we've uh, shown a measurement from filaments. We took um, bright red galaxies in the Sloan survey and uh, just lined them up like this. You took galaxies separated by a certain amount, and then we looked for the shear in between, because you expect a filament to be connecting massive galaxies. And we got a, we got a measurement. Yeah. For voids is what I was just going to show you when you asked me to go back. <laughs> So yesterday I had shown you that a void profile doesn't peak at the center because the mass profile of the void is pretty flat. Um, and because the shear is given by the difference of the integrated and local mass, it can go to zero at the center if the profile is completely flat. So this is a theoretical profile uh, that fits the data. So this is the data. This is the projected density inferred from the shear. Uh, and you can see it peaks at about 1. This is uh, 
about 20 megaparsecs uh, because it's plotted in units of the void radius. So we identified underdense regions in the galaxy distribution. We stacked them up. We measured the shear. Uh, and so this is the measurement at a distance of 20 megaparsecs from the center of the void. Um, so this is this uh, prediction using this best fit model. And the black points are our measurements. The pink magenta points is a test where we look at the B-mode component, uh, which should be 0 if, if all is well. And you can see it's consistent with 0. So we are measuring the radial elongation now around voids. And we are going out to 3 times the void radius. We have measurements out to 2, 2 and a half. So these are um, pretty large distances. So this is from a paper last year. Any questions about the measurement? So you know, with voids, the signal is much smaller. But because they're really big on the sky, you get to use a lot of background galaxies. This is from a paper that came out last week. These guys tried to solve uh, modified gravity equations in two models, some non-local model, they call it, and a cubic Galilean model. I haven't read the paper, but you can see uh, they choose these funny units to plot it. But if you imagine our data lining up with the QCDM model, which it roughly does, so that's a model with the same expansion history as the Galilean model, but general relativity. And their claim is that uh, this um, blue is the prediction of the Galilean model. So this is uh, already ruled out by the measurements I just showed you. I don't know at what statistical significance. But you know this is like a factor of two. And you can see from the error bars just by I that a factor of two, you would have a, a few one sigma deviations. Um, but of course, in the modeling of the void in GR itself, it's a slightly complicated story because you identify a void using galaxies and so on. Um, so there's some uncertainty, even in this GR prediction, uh, when you look at real voids. I don't know what this feature is due to. Has anybody read this paper? OK. So, uh, so you know, we had hoped that uh, voids would be uh, nice to test gravity theories because they are on-screen regions. Um, and uh, so you might expect um, force deviations to be larger. And that's what their results seem to show. OK, so that's the first two parts. Now I'm going to um, give you like a slightly simple broad overview of the current state of cosmology measurements. Uh, and the main goal is going to be to motivate the modified gravity discussion after that. So before we do that, uh, let's look at uh, what we, uh, you know, data sets. So the measurements I've shown you are all from imaging surveys. And there are three surveys currently in progress. I showed you results using less than 200 square degrees of data. Each of these surveys is covering more than 1,000 square degrees. We are doing 5,000. They're doing 1,500. They're doing maybe 2,000. They're doing 1,500. Uh, you know, different pros and cons to different surveys. But in the next five years, all of us hope to publish results. So that's a huge advance in the statistical precision. Related to imaging surveys, there are other surveys, right? You've heard about BAO measurements from BOSS. So spectroscopic surveys are used to, to measure uh, the 3D galaxy distribution. And there's two, at least two surveys that are going to come online in, a, in two or three years. Um, of course, CMB experiments are now measuring many things about the low redshift universe in addition to the CMB. Uh, at Redshift 1100. And so SPT and ACT now have next generation surveys that are a couple of years away. Uh, and they'll be measuring CMB lensing uh, and the SZ effect 
which tell you a lot about structure at the same redshift range as these guys. And you've heard about 21 centimeter surveys, uh, which hope to measure um, a 3D power spectrum using neutral hydrogen. So these are you know, four broad categories of surveys, imaging, spectroscopic, CMB, and 21 centimeter. I'm sure this is not a comprehensive list. I apologize if, you're, if I've left your favorite survey out. But these will have some activity in the next five years. So I mean, the last decade has been experimentally really rich with these spectacular results from WMAP and Planck. But the next decade, all fronts are going to be seeing major advances. Um, and then in the next decade, uh, at least on the imaging spectroscopic side of galaxy surveys, there's LSST, Euclid, and WFIRST. So LSST is a ground-based imaging survey. Euclid and WFIRST are space-based surveys that have some imaging and some spectroscopy. Okay. So, uh, so with these surveys, um, we're going to measure geometry, namely the distance redshift relation. So you can use the luminosity distance um, that uh, supernovae do or angular diameter distance that B BAO surveys do. Um, and you can measure the expansion rate itself, uh, which the BAO measurements um, give us. You can also measure the growth of structure, and you can measure it through fluctuations in the temperature of gas, the mass distribution um, through lensing. Uh, sorry, by this I meant the CMB, uh, the mass distribution, <coughs> gas, and galaxies. So these provide you many different ways of studying the growth of structure. And this is just a picture illustrating how structure grows from the CMB epoch to the present. So from this distribution of dark matter, we have all these different traces that tell us how stuff is growing. And each of them is very imperfect because we don't um, see the full 3D dark matter distribution directly. So you need to work with everything available. So uh, you know, with Planck, we have much higher precision on the CMB and on the redshift 1100 universe than the late time universe. So we kind of take that as a given and then use this lever arm uh, in scale and time to do all kinds of cosmological tests. And so the one that I'm going to talk about next is tests of gravity. Um, so this is uh, one more slide on overviewing stuff that we have these different probes. And uh, this is what is observed, and this is what it tells you. So weak lensing, you get out of an imaging survey, you measure the shapes of galaxies, you learn about some projection. Uh, that equation right there in the upper left corner uh, involves this W of z, which is distance factors, angular diameter distances, and the growth of structure. Uh, you measure large-scale structure primarily through spectroscopic surveys. The basic observable is the power spectrum of galaxies. And if you look at the BAO, you get the geometry. And if you look at the relative space distortions, you get the growth of structure. Galaxy clusters are special objects. You see them in imaging. Um, you can get um, their velocity dispersions through spectroscopy and you can get other estimates of their mass distribution through SZ and X-ray. Uh, their abundance is a cosmological probe that is sensitive to both geometry and growth. Supernovae, this is how dark energy was discovered. I assume you know the story that they get you the luminosity distance. And then there's a whole bunch of other probes, starting with strong lensing, in which the time delay gives you a Hubble constant. OK. So that's a one slide overview of the primary probes of cosmology that are used for dark energy or gravity or anything else you care about. And these are all the late time probes 
in addition to the CMB. Questions? OK, so this is the current uh, state of the field. Uh, I haven't updated it with the new Planck results, so apologies. Um, so this is the distance redshift relation, which is really well measured between redshift 0 and 1, and somewhat less well measured redshift above 1. So this is both supernovae and BAO data. And you can see that the best fit lambda CDM uh, works for nearly all the data points. Uh, you can do a cosmological analysis using this data. <clears throat> and that's what gives you this best fit lambda CDM model with omega lambda of 0.7, omega matter of 0.3. Uh, you can measure the growth of structure. I'm not attempting a review of the measurements of growth of structure. This is just giving you a flavor. Uh, galaxy clustering. So this is the distribution of galaxies. Um, uh, this is along the sky. This is along the line of sight. On large scales, the infall of galaxies squashes this distribution along the line of sight. And you can use that squashing, uh, or more generally, the, the dependence of the power spectrum on the cosine of this angle with respect to the line of sight. You can use that to learn about clustering and how it's evolving with redshift. This is uh, galaxy clustering measurements of the growth of structure at different redshifts. Uh, and this is. Um, this is galaxy lensing. This is CMB lensing plotted in uh, using power spectra. So sorry, these plots are not meant to give you some kind of nice summary, but just showing you the state of the field. If you like, you can look at the error bars, and you can see that any given skill, we are just barely getting. We are not yet at the 10% level, although the overall amplitudes are measured to the 10% level or better. So this is so there's a few anomalies. So generally speaking, lambda CDM is almost frustratingly successful. You cal you know you measure parameters using the CMB, and then you go out and measure other stuff, and it seems to work pretty well. But there's a few two sigma level anomalies that are worth watching, and David Weinberg's lecture notes had some discussion of them. I don't know how much he got to. So this is uh, uh, the amplitude of clustering. The blue band is the CMB measurement, Extrap uh, you know, um, forecast forward in time using lambda CDM. And these are measurements of galaxy clustering. You can see they have pretty big error bars, but they generally lie one sigma below the CMB. The CFH legacy lensing measurements come in right about here as well. We are trying to measure this amplitude with DES, and hope to have a paper out um, in a month and a bit. So we'll see whether we come out here or here or elsewhere. But you can see that the CMB extrapolation over predicts the growth of structure. So that means that the extrapolation may not be correct. In other words, maybe we should not use lambda CDM to do this extrapolation. Um, the other possibility is that these measurements are, uh, you know, they're within one sigma, so they may fluctuate as you improve the data set and move up to the one sigma bounds and be consistent after all. So an amusing fact that in general, modified gravity would have predicted a deviation that way. Because at least scalar tensor theories generally enhance forces so you would expect um, um, probes of structure using these kind of traces to give you a higher amplitude. So um, it's too early to, <laughs> to say anything conclusive, but it's worth noting. So this is what happens if you take this seriously and try to look in a dark energy parameter space, then the, lamp, the CMB and low redshift probes drive you into different directions. 
This is, again, a slightly outdated paper, but I like the color scheme. <laughs> so this is um, uh, from uh, Mark Wyman et al. Um, and so this is the amplitude of fluctuations, now marginalized. So this is Planck. I'm sorry, this is Planck. And this is the low redshift value. I'm not sure why the, this error bar is so tight. Um, but that's the direction of the discrepancy. Similarly, for H0, this discrepancy has evolved a little bit. Now, BO and Planck give similar measurements, but they're still supernovae at moderate redshifts give a higher expansion rate than the CMB. OK. So uh, whether or not you believe you take seriously these anomalies in the data, if you want to look beyond lambda CDM, then you want to look at the equation of state and how it departs possibly from minus 1. So this is the deviation from minus 1. What you can hope to do is that uh, this is redshift 0, almost the present. So observations begin somewhere here. Um, and so you can look at different redshift ranges and just empirically try to measure it. And you can ask these questions. Is dark energy constant? You can go crazy and drop quintessence-like models and ask, is it spatially clustered or anisotropic? You can look for couplings in the dark sector or dark sector and baryons. And finally, you can ask about modified gravity. Okay? So... These are the things that you can do with data. And um, so uh, now I'm going to get to this, mo this uh, motivation part of modified gravity. I'm sorry, I forgot. What time did I start? 11.15? I started 11.30. So I have 40 minutes. Sorry? Uh-huh. Thank you. Any questions? So you've heard, um, I wasn't there, but by all accounts, a very nice uh, first lecture from Rachel Rosen about modified gravity. Um, so I'm going to cover just uh, some of the general ideas of screening. And then I'll jump to observations um, as quickly as possible so that we don't have much overlap. But some of these ideas are new, so I'm sure it wouldn't hurt to hear them again. So, um, so as many of you know, uh, there's a theorem that the cosmological constant is the unique infrared modification to GR that does not introduce new degrees of freedom. So the moment you allow yourself to look beyond lambda, dynamical dark energy, or modified gravity, you're talking about new degrees of freedom which are also pretty generic in string theory, um, high dimensional uh, theories motivated by string theory and so on. So although these things don't produce the kind of modified gravity theories uh, we look at, the idea that there's new degrees of freedom um, that involve a scalar field coupled non-minimally to gravity uh, is just pretty common and unavoidable the moment you try to look beyond lambda CDM. So if you're looking at theories that uh, are or can be written as scalar tensor theories, then you generally expect enhancements to the gravitational potential. There's a scalar field, attractive forces. Uh, and so when you have a gravity theory, then uh, you, you can't be too choosy. Uh, and so you end up with potentially observable effects on all scales, okay? So we're going to talk about gravity theories that are trying to reproduce cosmic acceleration. So you imagine a theory that gives you exactly the expansion history of lambda CDM. Then when you look at perturbations and interactions, uh, you can change things on all scales. So that would be the signature of... Um, a difference from a dark energy model. 
uh, and the observational pursuits um, also test the idea that you just have dark energy, but there's some couplings to standard model particles. OK. So now I want to motivate the idea of screening. So let's consider the scalar field. It has some fluctuations that couple to the energy density. So the scalar field has to be light. Um, so it produces long range scalar forces, uh, which must be suppressed in order to pass solar system tests of GR. So uh, some natural ways to realize this have been um, um, have been uh, discussed or produced by theorists, including some people in this room. So let's look at this. Um, so if you look at the linearized equation of delta phi, then it looks like this. And there's three terms that can all be unconventional. The kinetic term, the mass term, or the coupling to matter. So I'm sure you guys have seen some of this before. But any one of these terms, um, you know, they're nonlinear, and they can accomplish the job of screening this force where we know um, GR is valid. So if you look at the interaction between two bodies, then there's an enhanced force, which looks like the Newtonian force times this term. So we'd like this term to to become really small inside the solar system. And you can do that by making the coupling really small, the mass really large, so that the interaction range is like submillimeter, or the kinetic term really large, which is the Weinstein mechanism that is the preferred one by, um, by many theories under discussion, uh, like massive gravity or Galilean theories. OK, so, um, so this discussion has not involved a specific model or a detailed theory. Uh, but just by looking at the way these different mechanisms work, you can get distinct observable effects as you go from modified gravity that you definitely need on large scales to produce cosmic acceleration to the regime um, you know, where we sit where we want to recover GR. So that's going from gigaparsec scales to 1 AU scales, where uh, GR has been tested. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can make this transition. Uh, and so that leads to a pretty diverse observable effects. And we know the parameters that we're after, uh, this coupling uh, or this mass term. So um, you know, as you know, uh, these parameters are going to vary depending on something like the density or the depth of the potential or the mass of the object uh, in which you're probing gravity. So that's how cosmological effects can show up in galaxies, um, because in unscreened environments, um, you have um, this metric with the potentials not being equal, uh, and in particular, the Newtonian potential that accelerates uh, you know, stars and galaxies gets a contribution from the scalar field. And uh, you know, in the models that we've seen, um, the force enhancements are you know, a factor of a third uh, in some theories. And if you work out how they accelerate um, uh, galaxies, you can get enhancements in the velocities of 10% or more. Uh, now, photons respond to the sum of these potentials. And uh, to the extent that these theories can be conformally transformed into an Einstein theory, um, this lensing uh, is unaltered. And so you generally find that things that you learn from dynamics uh, give you a larger answer for the mass distribution than what you learn from lensing. OK. So you know, these are very simple arguments. They often don't hold exactly for particular models. But they are quite useful 
for motivating um, tests of gravity. So this lensing and dynamics comparison, you can do on many different scales. You can even do it with very nonlinear systems that you don't understand fully, as long as you understand um, your lensing measurement and your dynamics. But you can also look at much smaller systems, because stars and gas and dark matter can respond differently. For chameleon theories, it was realized by um, by these guys um, that stars would evolve differently and you know astronomy as we know it could be different um, uh, you know they, they would evolve faster they would get brighter so the luminosities colors ages uh, could be a little different um, so there's one variant of that that I'll show you a little um, in a little bit that you can um, get uh, observable tests using pulsating stars. The other general difference is that you can look at traces that are themselves gravitationally very different. So, you know, dark matter, gas clouds, stars, and black holes have a very wide range of compactness. So if you look at a dark matter halo versus a gas cloud versus a star, the surface potentials are very different. And so they might um, feel the scalar force um, very differently because their screening levels can be different. So, you know, in, in some theories, a galaxy or cluster halo completely screens everything inside it. And in that case, you don't get a lot, of, um, lot to work with. But as soon as you drop that, that either smaller halos get unscreened or even big halos are not able to screen very compact objects, then you get all kinds of effects uh, that things move at different rates and you get segregation effects that black holes and stars and gas um, can, can even start to split apart. Um, in these two really nice papers, uh, Alberto and Lamb pointed out uh, an effect that would operate on neutron stars and black holes. Any questions? Sorry, I'm doing a lot of words and talking. So I'm about to show you some results. So these are, uh, you know, without specifying models, I've tried to give you general motivations to look at what I call astrophysical tests of gravity as distinct from either cosmological or solar system. The, the two traditional regimes um, are, you know, primarily the solar system and lab have done tests of GR that are good to one part in 10 to the 4, one part in 10 to the 5. It's really well tested. Cosmological tests are still at the 10% level. So this is like a kind of new regime motivated by screening um, mechanisms. So this is a one test. No known theory, uh, uh, none of the current theories predict a deviation in this regime, unfortunately. But the test is really nice, that you can look at an Einstein ring produced by an elliptical galaxy, and that gives you the lensing mass, okay? So you just measure the radius of the ring, the redshift of the lens, the redshift of the source, and it's like a 15 minute calculation to get the enclosed mass. Then you can uh, look at the stars in this elliptical galaxy and measure their velocity dispersion. Okay? And that gives you a dynamical mass. These stars are moving at hundreds of kilometers a second, and uh, it's like a really nice um, Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of velocities that gives you the, the, uh, the virial mass inside the same radius. And you can compare them, and these guys get like statistical errors of 5%. Uh, overall, it's like a better than 10% check. Um, and it gives you directly the ratio of these two metric potentials. The same test can be repeated using weak lensing um, on larger scales. So this is you know, a few kiloparsecs. Then you can go to. Um, 100 kiloparsecs, 1 megaparsec, 
And then you can go to even larger scales using power spectra that I'll show you in a second. OK, uh, I'll spend a few minutes on this test that involves pulsating stars, uh, because I, uh, we really enjoyed this little exercise and got pretty tight constraints on chameleon theories. So, uh, so nature has given us these pulsating stars, cepheids, which for more than a century have been used to measure distances because their pulsation period and luminosity are very tightly related. And so um, you can use that to, um, to get um, a distance because you measure the pulsation period. You, um, you use that to get the luminosity. You compare the luminosity to the measured flux. And then uh, since flux times 4 pi d squared is luminosity, you can get d. So this was a distance indicator. It's part of the program to measure the Hubble constant, but we turned it around as a test of gravity because the pulsation period goes like 1 over root g rho. You know, every time scale goes like 1 over root g rho, so the pulsation period does too. Uh, and so this relation actually holds when you solve this exactly. And because the scalar force enhances g, um, it lowers the pulsation period and messes up your distance estimate. So if you could compare a distance obtained by this method with another method that's not sensitive to the gravity theory, then you can get a test of gravity theories. So this is just to show you that when you do these astronomical tests, then everybody, especially cosmologists, tell you, oh, you don't want to mess with stars or galaxies, you know, nothing is measured well, nothing is understood well. Well, these are Cepheid variables. These are, uh, you know, four different observables, their size, their velocity, and their brightness. And the curve is a prediction of a numerical code, stellar evolution plus pulsation code, with just one or two free parameters. Uh, and you can see how well it does with the data. So we do understand some things about stars really well, even though you know the data looks crap. But uh, this is, these are the measurements that you get out of it if you're careful. Um, so this is the reason that you might want to look at astrophysical systems, because the same theory that produces only a few percent deviations on large-scale structure produces um, big enhancements. So this is the gravitational constant inside a star. This is the radius of the star. Um, and so deep inside it gets screened, but uh, in the envelope of the star um, for these kind of theories, you can easily get 10 or 20 percent enhancements. And even this one is allowed by cosmological tests. So we used uh, uh, data on just 25 galaxies to get a constraint on the field value uh, in chameleon theories, which translates into the range of this fifth force. So for kind of a natural cosmological theory, you'd like this to be at least hundreds of megaparsecs. This is one megaparsec. Uh, this is. I'm forgetting whether it goes like the square root or not. Uh, anyway, this is somewhat uh, between 3 and 10 megaparsecs. So, so these were the previous constraints. And we got constraints that were two orders of magnitude tighter than that. Uh, so this was two years ago. Since then, there are other measurements that are approaching this level as well. So, uh, so these theories are now you know, extremely unnatural because um, they involve this fine tuning of, um, of the field value. You may have heard of F of R theories. They are a subset of these theories as well. Sorry, I didn't explain what, what this plot is. This is the range of the force. This is the coupling constant. The colored regions are excluded. Oh, 
sorry, I'm like so spaced out. <laughs> this is not our constraint, forget that. Uh, this is our constraint. Uh, what, you know, uh, one, uh, one sigma, two sigma. Okay. Um, so uh, a summary then of how to look for deviations of gravity. Uh, ex you know, so the cosmological regime is here, 100 megaparsecs. These are all these astrophysical tests. Um, that I won't go over again, but they span like a really wide range of scales because you can go all the way to the interior of stars, um, starting with the outskirts of galaxy halos. I haven't talked at all about lab and solar system tests, but there's a number of interesting papers on all kinds of stuff. Um, you know, the, the test of the separation between the moon and the earth. Do you know that somebody, um, astronauts, put some mirrors on the moon when they went there decades ago? And uh, now there's an experiment where you shine a laser beam back and forth from those mirrors. And you can use that to measure the separation of the Earth and the moon to about a millimeter or centimeter. And you can do that over a lunar orbit. And that um, gives you a really nice test of gravity. So there's all kinds of clever experiments some of which are useful for these kind of Weinstein-like uh, theories, and others, uh, the predicted deviations are really small. So you have to think carefully. So the lesson I want you to take away is that when, you're, um, when you look at a new model, then in addition to calculating cosmological stuff, you should also think about special places. Um, galaxies or voids or special objects, black holes, um, or some very particular variants of lab and solar system tests. It's not easy because if you're a theorist or a cosmologist, you're not familiar with the state of the art of measurements, and um, you may not know some of the details of these systems, but it's a pretty fun exercise uh, once you get um, interested enough. Let's see, how much more do I have? OK. Um, <clears throat> so uh, once you start thinking about this and think about observations, so remember I had this slide showing the four or five cosmological probes and the different kinds of surveys. When you look at these astrophysical tests, you get even deeper into astronomy because you have these different types of tests. And they involve some really eccentric combinations of data spectroscopy to space imaging to radio observations. So they really, um, so all these observations exist. The instruments exist. You just need to put them together in interesting ways. And so we had some discussion um, about designing some new, you know, mini surveys um, for tests of gravity. But of course, even nicer if you can use existing data. OK, so let's go back to cosmology. So there's a metric. Um, and sorry for uh, the cut and paste job out of uh, this review article. But let's look at a few equations. So, um, so now, if you take that metric and uh, look at uh, the field equations for a scalar tensor theory, then you get a linearized growth of structure equation that looks like this. So this is the density field. So the second derivative of um, the density field is sourced by the potential. And there's the Hubble drag term. Uh, so this potential is the Newtonian potential. If you write down the Poisson equation in this gauge, then it involves the other potential um, and Newton's constant. So if you suppose you measure lensing and you want to relate your shear to the mass distribution, then well, you've measured this sum of potentials. So you probably want to introduce a new gravitational constant. So in GR, these two are equal. So that's why I've multiplied 4 by 2 to get 8 pi. 
But then you can test whether the G twiddle that you infer is Newton's constant or not. So you can now um, write the equation for the linear growth factor. So you can write the density field as um, its value at some fixed time times what's called the linear growth factor. Uh, and you can stick that into this linearized equation. And you get something that looks like this, where this G twiddle divided by the ratio of metric potentials is just G Newton in GR. But now you have two parameters the ratio of G twiddle to G Newton and the ratio of the metric potentials that you can um, try to measure. So I did something a little impolite to these guys. I'm introducing them, but I'm placing a question mark before, they're, you know, before I've even mentioned them. So why do I do that? Uh, it's because I'm not sure this parameterization is incredibly useful. So, uh, so there's been all this work on, um, you know, parameterized post-Friedman formulation of gravity theories, these how many parameters do you need, and what's the most general form. And that's useful because if you don't know anything about the theories, it's nice to have something to work with. But they're really functions because, you know, any, t any theory that we've seen, these guys depend on k. They depend on scale. Their time evolution is, is unconstrained. So, you know, from suppose you were to do a cosmological parameter analysis and you thought you could add two numbers to your standard, um, you know, five or six cosmological parameters and try to measure them, you could try to do that um, and you would get some constraints. But it, it would be a very, uh, a very weak exercise in testing gravity. You'd be much better off if you actually had some handle on their space and time dependence and you could go after that specifically. So I think uh, we really will want to take particular models and work out their particular predictions, even though you know, all the theorists tell us, yeah, this is the model I came up with. Don't take it too seriously, please. But, but uh, you know, there's no easy option. There's no very general test you can do uh, without losing a lot of precision. Because if you let these guys be functions of scale and time, you're going to need some survey that won't be done till 2050 to really measure it well. Um, so, so staying general, it's hard to be powerful. Whereas if you are, try to do a powerful test of a particular model, you're just testing that particular model. So that's my depressing conclusion. But uh, the good news for you guys is that there's new things to do from the theoretical side to just figure out how to formulate the predictions in a way that um, can be tested. OK. I'm tired. You're tired. Luckily, we're out of time. So I'm going to have just one slide on this idea that uh, you, know, you can test gravity by look, comparing growth and geometry. But let's look a little bit closer at what we mean by growth, because we've already motivated the idea that given a mass distribution, if you measure its properties using light deflection or velocities or the distribution itself, you will get different answers if you do your interpretation assuming GR, but in fact, GR is not right on those scales. So to do that on cosmological scales, uh, you know, you got to work with power spectra. So this is the power spectrum of the density field. This is the power spectrum of the lensing field, where we've generalized kappa to, uh, you know, have different redshifts. And so this is now given by a projection of this density power spectrum. But we've introduced a function that lets you break GR. So this guy is given by some combination of G and phi and psi. Um, and you can calculate how different it is. When you measure the galaxy distribution in redshift space, then you're sensitive to a different growth factor, uh, namely the growth factor involved in velocities. And because velocities 
come out of flows, out of a mass distribution, you can use the continuity equation to relate the velocity growth factor to the time evolution of the density growth factor. And these are some conventional symbols used to represent it. So, for observational purposes, we have three growth factors. If we could measure the density field directly, um, and you know the bias distribution of galaxies gives you that, uh, then that's the density growth factor d, then the lensing growth factor is d squared times this guy, and the velocity growth factor is this particular derivative. So more specifically, if you measure the galaxy power spectrum as a function of wave number and the angle of the line of sight with respect, uh, the line of sight and that wave number, then it's, it can be decomposed into these three terms. So this guy is the transverse direction. Um, and this guy is the line of sight direction where you're entirely sensitive to velocities because you're only measuring redshifts. And this is the cross term for some intermediate angle. Uh, and so you get a combination of this velocity growth factor and the density growth factor. So you can use all these power spectra and try to get at these different growth factors separately. And that's kind of fun because if you're uh, just committed to dark energy plus GR, then you only need one of these observables and you've got the growth factor. So whichever gives you a tighter error bar, well, too bad for the other guys, right? But uh, if you're trying to test gravity theories, you really want them all independently. So that makes a life as an observer uh, more fun. All right, last slide. So I hope I've introduced you to the idea of many different experimental tests. And although I didn't say it uh, on every slide, these are also tests of some peculiar dark energy model. Um, and so let's classify them. Again, there's the idea of testing growth versus expansion. It operates on tens or 100 megaparsecs to gigaparsec scales. And it tests the hypothesis that our universe is described by GR plus some smooth dark energy. Okay. The current accuracy is at the 10% level. And in um, five or seven years, we'll be at the 2 to 4% level. Then this concept of different growth factors is another variant of lensing versus dynamical masses that you can measure inside galaxies all to all the way to these large scale power spectra. And this is a test of GR. Currently, it's not very accurate. We can hope for 5% um, accuracy. So these numbers are now are going to be dominated by systematic errors in the different ob observations. So just as B Bruce Partridge um, emphasized uh, that you know, if you're interested in uh, primordial gravity waves and B-mode polarization, uh, you probably want to learn a little bit about CMB detectors and scan strategies. So similarly, this error budget is going to be dominated by some hardcore experimental things that, uh, that you might want to look at if you're interested in one of these tests. So then I mentioned these astrophysical tests, which is like you know, a dozen different things, depending on the theory, that go from the interior of stars to the outer parts of halos. And they kind of rely on the qualitative behavior of screening mechanisms. So if you come up with a new tracer or a new test, you could get um, massive improvements. And then there's the century-old program of testing GR, uh, the PPN program, that parts of it can be powerful tests of gravity as well. So that's the whole landscape. If you want to learn more about the theory or the experiment, there's a number of really good reviews. This is the one I was involved in, so that's the one I'd recommend. Thank you very much.